Hi, I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, and here with a different kind of Ask Dave video. This is where Dave asks the questions. We have with us Ray, who is uh, one of the two owners of Coax USA and sells a lot of cable. Uh, he he gets cable from U.S. manufacturers and then he assembles them with whatever kind of connector you want on the end and whatever length you might want. And it's interesting as I interviewed Ray to find out how committed he is to coax in general and to his business in particular. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how uh, coax is made, what makes uh, one kind of coax different from another kind of coax, and some connector types that I'd never even heard of. Uh, so uh, let's tune in again. This is Ray from Coax USA. So Ray, how are you? I'm doing well. Good. I appreciate you taking some time to talk with me today. Not a problem at all. Yeah, tell tell uh, my viewers a little bit about your business and how you came to get into it. Sure, MPD Digital uh, started about nine years ago now. Uh, I'd always, you know, done buying and selling online, and I happened into a few pallets of LMR 400 cable. Um, I found out that uh, making cable assemblies was was pretty fun, actually except for when it started taking up every bit of my free time. So, uh, so my wife came in and uh, took over the business uh, while I went back to work as a government contractor. And in the last several years, basically, it's grown to a, uh, we did almost one and a half million in sales last year. Uh, and primary customers for us are, are Amazon.com, Walmart, Cisco, Tyco, uh, Lockheed, uh, plus a whole, whole lot of amateurs out there. Uh, we found out very soon, very easily and very quickly, the amateur radio community were the greatest folks to deal with. And uh, so I would say about 50% of our business right now is, uh, is on the amateur radio side. Uh huh. Well, now let me pose a scenario for you. Um, suppose a new amateur who just got his general. Uh, or tech is calling you up and say hey I got my ham license um, I've heard I need to get some coax uh, sell me what I need what do I need uh, that actually happens three or four times a week uh, <laughs> just exactly as you described it and the first thing I ask him is uh, okay is this for two meters is this for you know is this for 20 meters I mean what are we what are we going to be using it for mm -hmm. and are you talking just a short jumper or are you talking a long transmission line for an antenna and, and the thing you have to consider here is that the your your radio your transmission line including all your jumpers and everything connecting to your antenna and the antenna itself is our one single system and the idea is to move the signal from your radio the most efficiently way, efficient way possible to the antenna for radiation and propagation out through the ether. So what you want to do is ensure that the that the cable you get will last, will work well, and uh, at the same time you don't want to overspend. Uh, because if you're coming to me and saying you're only going to be using it for, for 60 meters, 80 meters, and 40 meters, uh, what what do you need? I'm probably going to tell you. Well, if it's you know less than 75 or 100 feet, we can do RG8X and you'll be just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to come tell me it's for uh, a two meters or 440 or or satellite use, then we're going to have to look at LMR 400 uh, and a microwave capable cable. But there's the cables we sell are basically priced. Uh, at all different price points from 25 cents to two dollars and fifty cents a foot depending on what the requirement is of the customer and how how efficient a cable they need in order to get their signal uh, propagated because you want to give them what they need and you want to make sure that they're not having to pay out the pay through the nose for it at the same time how do you persuade a ham that if uh, they're 
uh, let's say their dipole antenna, the feed point's going to be just outside in the backyard, that they need more than 10 feet of coax. Understand that coaxial cable is not as the, it's not as the, uh, the crow flies. If you take a piece of string or a piece of rope and you go from the back of your radio, drop it down to the floor, take it out the window, drop it down to the ground, or run it up to the eaves, then run it to where your antenna is going to be, you'll end up with an accurate measurement. Because you've got to take into account all the twists and curves and bends and everything else when you're running your antenna uh, antenna line. And when you're looking at how far your antenna is from your radio, you, ne you never think that way. You don't think in terms of all the, all the twists and curves and turns. And it always adds up to more than what you think it is. Oh, I've been bit by that so many times. Uh, oh, yeah. It gets to the point now, I, I buy bulk coax, put a connector on one end, put that on the antenna, right. and see how much is left by the time I right. get to the uh, spark arrestor. Uh, what's the most popular kind of cable you sell? Oh, it's either LMR240 or LMR400. We probably sell more fun. We probably sell about 30% more LMR400 than anything else. Really? Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, then would come LNR, LMR 230, RG213, RG8X, RG8U, RG58, uh, and then several other more isoteric, you know, off the wall type cables like 223, 214, those guys. Now, I remember RG8U when I was young and I don't see it so much anymore it's either RG213 or LMR400 yeah I went out actually uh, the RG8U we have is cable I had made for us in, uh, by Conwire in Chicago uh, I went out and took the old RG8U specs and, and had them build it up uh, and the only difference is the RG8U we have is, is UL listing it's UL listed cable because there's no bell specs on it anymore so, uh, but it's the only difference between the RG8U and the RG213 is the RG213 will handle a little more power. Really? Uh, but the RG8U has the same loss uh, and easily handles full legal limit all the way up to two meters. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, I like the RG8U. It's a little bit more flexible. Uh, the dielectric is a little bit softer in it, so it handles handles a little bit, uh, I mean, it handles a little bit better, but at the same time, uh, some guys don't like it because they can't pump 5,000 watts of power through it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, what the heck. So we were talking about LMR 400 versus RG213 versus RG8U. Right. And uh, I've noticed that the LMR 400 that I've used, this is my first experience using it, it is stiff as a board. I mean, you could hold it sideways 20 feet and it wouldn't go down on either end. And the RG213 that I have is flexible and soft. Right. And I've been thinking I should take my RG213 out of service and just use it for jumpers and then use run the LMR400 from the lightning arresters all the way to the antennas uh, because that stuff doesn't get moved. Um, right. The, the thing with LMR 400, it, and the, the main difference between the RG series uh, 213 and 8U and the LMR series of 400 is, is the polyethylene jacket. Mm -hmm. the, the RG 213 and RG 8U have a PVC jacket, a very soft plastic jacket. Yeah. And the LMR 400 has a hard polyethylene jacket. Now, the LMR 400 is manufactured so you can bend it 90 degrees in an inch if you need to. Uh, and it doesn't have any cause any attenuation when you bend it that sharply. If you're running an installation and you need to bend it in a sharp curve or curl it up, it actually has a it actually has a four inch uh, minimum uh, minimum radius for, for coiling it. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's that it'll t handle that tight of coil. Um, and the reason it has the polyester jacket, or excuse me, the polyethylene jacket, is because they wanted it to be able to handle abuse. They wanted it to be able to rub up against the side of metal buildings, 
to rub up against trees, to rub up against pole installations. You remember it was basically built for microwave use to run up cell towers and stuff like that. And when the wind's beating it up against the side of a tower, they wanted it to be able to last 20 years before those guys had to replace that cable. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the reason they went with a very hard jacket. Now, that's not to say that you can't have LMR 400 with the, with the PVC jacket. I actually had some made with PVC jackets. We had 100,000 feet of it made, and we sell it. Here's our marine cable to run shipboard uh, because it's flexible to go up and down sailboat masts. If you eliminate the hard, hard plastic jacket, put a PVC jacket on it, then it becomes almost as flexible as 213 because even though it's solid core, it has the foam dielectric instead of the solid hard dielectric. So there's there's workarounds for it. Mm hmm Well, it sounds like for, uh, you know, that RG8X isn't always RG8X isn't RG8X. Are there multiples of that? There is no set standards anymore for RG-type cable. Um, I'll give you an example how bad it's gotten. We just got a, a, uh, a spool of cable in sent to me by a customer not long ago, uh, and it was RG58 cable that he got a really good deal on it, and they sent it to me to test. What I found out was the entire cable assembly was made out of aluminum. There was no copper in it. Really? Uh, yeah, it was it came out of China. The, the braid on the outside was aluminum, and the center braid was kind of a copper washed or copper electroplated aluminum wire. And yeah, they can call it RG58 all they want. And it looks, it's the same size and the jacket says RG58 on it, but it weighs like less than half as much as standard 58, simply because there's no copper in it. And you can imagine how well it functioned. It, it didn't work worth the damn. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there's, there's, Nowadays, if you're not sure where you're buying your RG cable from, you end up with some real, some real doozies because the other thing we see in with RG type cable as well as some of the offshore LMR types is what they call shaving. You know, it costs a lot to run a 12 gauge solid copper wire or a 10 gauge solid copper wire. So what they do is they'll simply run Oh, a ten and a half gauge wire, mm -hmm. or they'll run a wire that's eighty-five percent the size of what it should be in there, and they'll advertise ninety-five percent shielding. They'll they'll put out a cable with eighty-five percent shielding. Copper is expensive, and so every foot of cable they make, and they they're shaving copper off of it, saves the factory money, and most. Most hams never notice it because they're only running about eighty percent of capacity. If 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 their if their installation never goes above say a hundred watts, and a lot of the times they'll never notice it. But if they're pushing the cable to where it's rated maximum limit or, or above eighty percent of its rated maximum, then your SWR is going to start shooting up. You'll start getting a lot more heat loss of your of your transmission power. A whole lot of things along that line will happen. Um, that's one of the reasons that Underwriters Laboratory had went to 3D imagery uh, for their new their new certification seals is because they were being counterfeited, and so we had counterfeit cable, counterfeit UL seals, counterfeit everything coming in. So uh, there's been some huge lawsuits about it recently. Now uh, the RG or I'm sorry the LMR 400 that I bought had what looked like an, a copper-coated aluminum center. Right. What they did when they designed that cable is they said, okay, how do we get the best efficiency, the highest velocity factor with the lowest loss? And what they found, it, what they found was that a braided copper wire had less efficiency and more loss than a solid copper wire, and that a aluminum solid aluminum wire clad with pure 100 percent copper because of skin effect actually had a better trans uh, transmission efficiency and less loss and had more heat than than a solid copper wire did and that's the reason they went that direction with it 
Um, it's interesting because the Ultraflex uh, LMR 400 with the rubberized jacket has a braided copper center. Uh -huh. And it's a little bit less efficient than the standard LMR 400 that has the copper clad aluminum center in it. Uh -huh. We sell, we probably sell 20 to 30,000 feet of LMR 400 a week. Um, and that is probably twice as popular as everything else, simply because it's a household man. Connectors. Uh, hams tend Sorry. to use PL 259s. QRPers who are in the know use uh, BNC. Um, I've never been able to make a BNC connector work <laughs> on a cable. Um, what? Talk to me about those connectors. Uh, I mean, the aficionados tell me you should use end connectors. What? what wh where? Where does this go with all the connectors? You know, connectors are one of the biggest issues in cables today. And the reason for that is, let's just look at a PL259 connector. I can buy PL259 connectors right now. Say I, I buy connectors in lots of 10,000 or 20,000 each. Right. So I buy PL259 connectors right now for 25 cents a piece, or I can buy a PL259 connector that looks the same to you for a dollar ninety a piece, or sometimes two ninety, depending. In other words, the connectors these days, depending on how well they're made, are not at all the same quality as what they could be. Hmm. Um, and PL two fifty nines are easy to cheat people on because all you have to do is use less brass or or uh, a a much more tin than copper alloy mm -hmm. and a bit nickel plating and you can really get put out a whole lot of cheap stuff that's going to degrade over time and not do well or you can use uh teflon instead of plastic if you ever try and solder on a pl259 connector and, and the, the dielectric melts then you know you got a bad connector <laughs> uh, but uh, real good PL259 connectors, the ones we, the ones I had designed and built to Amphenol specs from the 70s, are made uh, with a Teflon dielectric, a center silver conductor, and uh, we switched over to use phosphor bronze instead of silver plating on the outside because it gives you 80% of the efficiency of silver, but never tarnishes and never degrades. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the new mill spec required phosphor bronze instead of uh, instead of silver, um, but PL two fifty nine connectors overall are not a good connector anymore. And back in the forties and fifties, they were absolutely the best thing available. But if you go outside the United States today, you will find that the radios that are made by the major manufacturers are not shipped with PL two fifty nine connectors on. Um, they've shipped their ship with either DIN connectors or with N connectors. What are, what are uh, DIN stuff. connectors? Sir? What are DIN connectors? Uh, DIN. D DIN is in D-I-N. Yeah. Uh, Delta India November. Um, DIN connectors are a new type of connector design with a much thicker center conductor and a, um, a much more robust body that are capable of handling, handling high power loads and heat uh, with absolutely, with almost no loss. Um, they're great connectors. If you ever, if you ever have a cable that's built for Verizon or AT&T or any of the major cellular carriers uh, or any of their major channels, you, you'll see DIN connectors on those cables. The catch is, is that a, a good DIN connector runs you about twenty-five to thirty dollars per connector, hmm. um, and heck, I can't get hams to pay two dollars a connector sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and a DIN connector is really overkill for amateur radio use because they're really made to function up around nineteen hundred megahertz to two thousand megahertz, and, and with a whole lot of signal throughput. Uh -huh. uh, an N connector, on the other hand, you know, N connectors have been around for years and years. 
Um, they have a huge benefit as far as much, much less loss. Uh, they come with a silicone gasket that basically when you screw an end male and an end female together, it's waterproof. Uh, and that's something that a PL259 and SO239 were never ever designed to be. They don't make a waterproof PL259. Um, and they probably, and, and they never will because the standard just doesn't support it. Um, so when, when at all possible, I advise hams, especially when on your tower and connecting to your antennas, if you can buy an antenna that has an end female on it or an end connector, go for it because you're going to get a much longer lifespan. It'll, uh, it'll carry your signal better. It'll have less loss. And uh, anytime you get a chance to use a connector other than the PL259, go for it. BNCs are efficient connectors. Uh, Neil Councilman knew what he was doing when he uh, when he developed them. The BNC stands for Bayonet Neil Councilman Bayonet connector invented by Neil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the problem is, is if every manufacturer has completely different. BNCs are made about 15 different ways. Mm -hmm. Every manufacturer that you're dealing with for the connector has different pin configurations and different strip configurations for them. And they all end up looking the same and functioning the same, but they're assembled differently. So you may put on a BNC, and the next time you put on a BNC, it looks completely different <laughs> when you take it apart in the number of pieces you're working with. And it's really, the BNCs are really kind of one of those weird connectors. But, uh, you know, they work well up to about 3 gigahertz. And one thing they don't tolerate is abuse. You can't tug on them, trip on them, pull on them, or anything else. Because those little those little pins that are holding the male and the female together will strip loose. Mm -hmm. Okay. The better connector of those, however, is called a TNC, which was also invented by the same guy because he found that people kept breaking BNCs because they snapped and people would break them off in industrial settings. So the TNC connectors are the same size, but they screw on. Mm. And you screw them on just like you do an end, and they stay stay fixed. Uh, we use a lot of TNC connectors on shipboard installs when we're joining cabling together, uh, coming down a mast and then into a boat or something like that. You know, coaxial cable is a totally uncomplicated thing and yet, at the same time, it's so easy to cheat people on. Um, what about um, buying bulk cable, putting on your own connectors, versus buying cable with connectors already on? What's your recommendation? I know you sell the one with it already on, but you also sell bulk cable, too, don't we you? Sell, we sell a ton of bulk cable. Uh, in fact, on our web, both our website and Amazon, you can order bulk cable by the foot, any, any number of feet you need up to 500 feet at a time. Uh, and we'll sell it up to 2,000 feet at a time if you really want a big spool. Um, but if you've got the skill to put on a, a connector and you, you want to do it, um, it's not that hard. Uh, but it, it, takes, it takes attention to detail, a good soldering iron or a good crimping tool, a good stripping tool, um, and the ability to, to, to do that soldering and, and not have any cold joints and, and have it flow through the way it needs to. Mm -hmm. So anybody can really learn to put on a connector. Just don't expect to get it right the first time. <laughs> and, you know, be prepared to redo it and rework it until you get it right. And then make sure you test it after you put it on there. Uh, to make sure that your SWR is where you want it to be and your connectivity conductivity is where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you the machine we use in house to strip cable runs about 18 grand. It's a computer. I, every manufacturer has specific stripping criteria for, con for their connectors by the millimeter, and we basically just program the machine with its little computer, program it in for the, a particular manufacturer connector stick the cable in, hit the button, and it strips it for that connector, and you slide the connector on, and you're done. Um, but, you know, we built, we probably built cables for two years by hand before we bought the uh, the machine. So you can do it either way. Yeah. Now, um, 
I've seen in the past, not not fairly recently, but like you could get RG8 dash type cable. Mm -hmm. uh, DX Engineering uh, was one of those where you'd buy uh, DXE RG58. Right. Were, were those foreign cables or cables made yeah. domestically? Or? That's a great question. It depends. Um, DX Engineering actually has their cable made in the exact same factory on the exact same assembly line as we have some of our cable made. Um, there's only about six cable manufacturers left in the country. And anybody who designs a specific type of cable and wants 100 to 250,000 feet of it can get it manufactured to their specifications. And it'll say on the jacket, DX Engineering, it'll say MPD Digital. Uh, it'll say in, you know, DX Engineering has an LMR 400 type cable made there, just as we do. And there says, uh, I think it's DXZ 400, or mine says MPD 400. Mm -hmm. um, but you can get that done either in a very good, high quality U.S. manufacturing plant, mm -hmm. or you can have the same thing done uh, overseas. Um, I'll tell you that if I had my cable made in China, I could do it for 13 cents a foot. Uh, I pay 59 cents a foot for what I had manufactured. Yeah. There's a huge difference in markup and, I mean, I'm talking 13 cents a foot delivered to Los Angeles. Yeah. So there's a, there's a huge markup and quality difference in just like everything else, I guess, that's made these days. Um, whether or not you're going to go Chinese, or whether or not you'll have it made in a, in a, you know, a mil spec to a mil spec standard in the U.S. one. Well, Ray, thank you for your time, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. All right, take care. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. Okay, we're just going to split this. Well. I found that fascinating. I learned a lot about coax that I didn't know before. I had never heard of some of those connectors. It sounds like there's a much broader world out there of coax than there is just in amateur radio. So let me know what you think of this uh, format uh, because it's uh, straightforward for me to do uh, with Skype and it's I think interesting. Uh, I point out that uh, I appear every Tuesday on the W5KUB show, which you can get by going to W5KUB.com uh, at, uh, let's see, it's 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Uh, and I decided, well, let's give that trick a try and see if uh, we can get some other things going. So that's pretty cool. All right, uh, please, please do me a favor. Click on like, please click subscribe, and then once you've subscribed, click on the little bell so that you get notified every time there's a new video. Also, you can ask questions via ask uh, via uh, ke0og.net uh, forward slash ask hyphen Dave and those questions come straight to me another great way to do it is on the comments I must admit uh, from a channel point of view I'm just about to the point where I get so many comments that I can't quite reply to everyone so if I don't reply to your comment please don't take that personally I really do try to to at least look at them and if there is something I can add quickly I I will do that I will do that also please uh, check out the chip jar and the patreon uh, method and above all very important use both feet when walking until we next meet 73